Here, I am shocked. This is. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Hold on, Brad. Guys, it's me, Brad from SlashFilm.com. <laughs> Brad, what's happening? I <laughs> cannot believe James Gunn just got rehired for Guardians of the Galaxy Three. This is news that has made my year, my decade, my life. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I am also a Guardians mega fan. Like you, you know. Before we get into the reaction, Ben, tell us what is going on here. Yes, so Deadline reports that they've confirmed with both Marvel and with James Gunn's represent representatives that James Gunn is coming back to direct Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Uh, they said that this decision was actually made months ago after, uh, after conversations between Gunn and uh, Walt Disney Studios president Alan Horn. Uh, apparently they talked a bunch of times and, and Horn just decided that it was a good idea to bring him back on. They, he, they made some sort of mention that uh, Horn was convinced or, or, or felt that uh, Gunn's reaction was appropriate in terms of just like apologizing again and sort of keeping his head low and, and not really, um, you know, making a big fuss about everything. And he just, you know, the professional way that James Gunn hand handled this entire terrible situation, which was, you know, orchestrated in bad faith from the very beginning. Uh, it seems like his professionalism ended up coming back around and being the thing that, that ended up getting him the job again. Uh, Marvel apparently never met with or considered any other director for Guardians 3. So all of the, that talk about maybe Taika Waititi or Adam McKay potentially stepping in was just, you know, unfounded rumor. Um, and we the only other really concrete piece of information that's probably worth noting here is that James Gunn is going to direct the Suicide Squad, a.k.a. Suicide Squad 2, for DC, and then uh, begin production on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So uh, Marvel and, and Disney are uh, letting him, I guess, honor that the deal that he's already made with Warner Brothers and DC and, and letting him tackle that film first before uh, Guardians 3 gets up and running. And by the way, letting him tackle that film first, I think, is a bit loaded. I keep on seeing people say that on Twitter. I'm sure he has a contract that prevents him from doing anything until he's done with the Suicide Squad. You know, uh, that whatever. that's probably true. Yeah, I could have I could have chosen better <laughs> words to to say that. Yeah, good call. But people are like surprised that like Marvel is letting him do that. I I feel like there's no way around that. And Suicide Squad comes out in the summer of 2021, which means that we're probably not going to he's not probably not going to get started on Guardians 3 until probably late 2021 which means we won't see it until 2022 or 2023 yeah I mean, that's, well, that's well, the probably good, right uh, yeah but the good news about this too is like since like the the script is done and stuff they might be able to fast track it you know depending on how i guess how far they had if they were into pre-production at all before oh, they were they had boards yeah. they were location scouting they were like yeah, so, so then so it might not be it might not take them as long so maybe they'll get it done sooner yeah Maybe he can prep, you know, do the the rest of prep while he's working on Suicide Squad. I'm not sure how, like, contracts work. Like, if you're even allowed technically to do that uh, when you're committing yourself to one studio for one film. Um, but, okay, Brad, I, I know you, you kind of gave your reaction, but uh, give us a little more of it. No, sir, I, I'm I'm so pumped for this. Uh, it's It's been such a downer uh, ever since James Gunn was fired. Even re-watching the Guardians movies, just thinking about... You know, him not being around for the third chapter, not him not getting to complete what he set out from the beginning. You know, he, he had talked about before how Guardians 3 was supposed to, you know, bring the, the arcs of the original Guardians uh, to an end and, you know, usher in an, a new era for them, maybe with some new characters and kind of kick off the, the next 10 years of the cosmic side of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and even though they've t like Kevin Feige has recently like kind of downplayed that a little bit, there's there's no denying that whatever James Gunn does with Guardians, you know, would have an impact on what happens with some of the future MCU movies, especially when it comes to the Guardians characters yeah. st well, sticking around. I, I do want to uh, ask you a question. Do you think that Feige was downplaying that because they didn't think James Gunn was coming back, or do you? I mean, w what do you think the motive was there? I'm not sure, especially since Ben said this is something that would happen months ago. Like, I wonder if maybe Kevin Feige was just deflecting and kind of just trying to keep keep the conversation away from it for yeah. whatever reason, because uh, he didn't want to, you know, hint at any, you know, um, idea of reconciliation yet until the news was official or something like that. Um, I, I'm I'm willing to bet that James Gunn maybe isn't quite as integral to the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe as maybe it seemed to begin with. Like, he's not like this 
uh, you know, uh, mastermind behind it, like who, like um, who will be in charge and overseeing yeah. stuff. But I imagine that whatever they set into motion in Guardians Three will have some kind of impact on char- how some characters are introduced, or maybe where those characters go and, and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm very excited for this, and you know, I, I also wonder if his role will be diminished. I, I wonder if he's taking this as more of like. You know, an in and out gig, like he's coming in to direct this movie, and then that's going to be, you know, the end of his time at Marvel, where before it seemed like he kind of had an investment uh, in the future yeah, of Marvel. It'll, yeah, for sure. It'll be interesting to see how, how that plays out. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't be more excited about this. It's it's uh, it's interesting because he's now kind of like pulling a J.J. Abrams in a way, in the way that J.J. did both Star Wars and Star Trek, and now he's doing the two comic book franchises that have, you know, killer uh, soundtracks. <laughs> Yes. Um, <laughs> That's the first thing we all think of when we think about Suicide Squad is the killer soundtrack. <laughs> to be fair, the soundtrack was good, even though they didn't utilize it in the best way. Then, right. And that was probably the best thing about the movie. Yeah. Okay, HD, what do you think about this? Well, I think either way, Jane's going to be going to be laughing to the bank because he, like you said, has two comic book franchises now under his belt and they're both probably going to be very lucrative. So he is the winner in this case. And yeah, I think this is really great, especially after Disney, um, you know, fired James Gunn in like in bad faith. And it was, you know, over tweets that were, um, you know, not well, like they were in um that's what I'm looking for. In poor taste. In poor taste, yes. They were in poor taste, but James Gunn um, apologized for it and um, did a really good job of just kind of showing that he was, um, you know, of sorry for his actions, which is um, the deadline piece also notes that, like, unlike Kevin Hart, who kind of, you know, attacked his, um, attacked people who were accusing him, uh, James Gunn actually, like, felt remorse for this and I think that was a really good way of putting of going around it so um I think this is great and yeah I don't think anyone could have really nailed this franchise except for James Gunn and with the talks being done like months before um makes a lot of sense considering Disney was just so quiet about like who would be the director for Guardians, Guardians 3 and all the other directors just kind of staying f- far away from um yeah. even like considering doing it uh, Peter, before we move on, real quick, do you think this and, and Wait, I want talk... to still talk about this for, for a okay, bit more? Okay, but, um... okay. I didn't know how much you you had lo- locked and loaded, but really quickly, do do you think that uh, any of this, any of this behind the scenes maneuvering and all these conversations and, and decision making and stuff, do you think that has anything to do with why uh, Marvel has not said anything about what their plans are post Spider Man Far From Home, or do you think that's just coincidental? I think that's coincidental. I think they always okay. plan to reveal stuff at either Comic Con or D twenty three. You know, I, I've talked about on this podcast like who could replace James Gunn because any reputable geek filmmaker, uh, you know, that has some uh, cachet uh, with the geek audience, I don't think wanted to take this job and. Anybody that they could hire would be someone that, you know, wants it as an opportunity. And I feel like would have just uh, it would have been a nightmare. It would have like, you know, just from a, a marketing publicity standpoint, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine that director doing interviews to promote the film. Um, so yeah, James- just a terrible situation for any director to walk in, you know, and to, to inherit a franchise that is so closely associated with Gunn's sensibilities. It just would have been, yeah, a really, really bad situation for anybody else. Ben, we haven't gotten your reaction to this. What What, what is your reaction? I mean, obviously, I'm thrilled. I, I think I'm more surprised and shocked than, than even, like, uh, jumping up and down, <laughs> although I am really, really happy about it. I just can't believe that a huge studio... I mean, uh, you know, we talked about this when Gunn was fired. Like, I, I just am bowled over by the fact that a massive studio would make such a huge, high-profile public decision that, you know, they had the opportunity to immediately go back on this and and rehire him, you know, a week after they fired him after saying and, and say something like, OK, you know, we've we've taken some time to think about this. We've looked at where this campaign came from and we don't agree with how this whole thing was organized. We see now that it was like a, a you know, a, an organized attack. And uh, we've had conversations with James Gunn, who's already apologized even before, you know, being fired. And we've decided to bring him back onto the fold. But the longer you know, the more time passed, I just thought it was less and less likely that they were going to back down because it's, you know, Hollywood is such an ego driven place. And for 
a major studio to make a, a huge reversal like this um, is a really, really big deal. Well, we, we had even heard rumors at the time that Kevin Feige was pushing for this way back when. And then, you know, came the standpoint of I, I remember Bob Iger said that it wasn't going to happen. Um, and I think that kind of crushed all of us. <laughs> like, that was when we all were like, oh, it's not going to happen. So I, I am so excited for this. You know, I I actually own a rehire uh, James Gunn t-shirt that's in the Guardians of the Galaxy font. So just like my Michael Jackson t-shirts, which I'm going to have to throw that in the garbage uh, because it's not relevant anymore. And um, <laughs> in a different way, in a very different way. I think I think you should keep it and have James Gunn sign it. Tenet. I remember I wore it to like a Disney, like a press event for Wreck-It Ralph. And I got like a ton of like direct messages and text messages like, is Disney going to be pissed at you for it? <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm so happy about this news. Like, recently I did my ranking of all the MCU movies and short films. And Guardians of the Galaxy, for me, is still the number one film out of all that. Uh, I I just love it so much. I remember being at Comic-Con this year, or last year, I guess, and uh, hearing the news that uh, James Gunn was fired, like, totally ruined my whole Comic-Con experience. Like, it, it, like, he really, like, I don't know, I, I really can't think of much of, like, what is current pop culture that isn't from my childhood. Like, you know, obviously Star Wars is a big thing, of mine but like you know guardians galaxy is on my walls it's on my t-shirts i wear it i live it and james gunn is just such a part of my my life and i i'm 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 so happy guys i'm just i'm just i'm just ecstatic Uh, you know it was funny uh in the slack channel yesterday because what happened yesterday with the infinity war poster you actually kind of predicted this, uh, or you made a joke about this, Ben. <laughs> yeah, I was, just, you know, there was the, the whole thing yesterday was uh, Denai Guerrero, the, who plays uh, Koye in Black Panther. Her name was left off of the very top of the Avengers and uh, Avengers Endgame poster, and Disney sort of backtracked on that and included her name after like this huge online backlash. And I was sort of shocked that they would. <laughs> that they would alter their marketing poster to include her name when a lot of that stuff is des- is decided by, you know, agents and contracts and stuff like that. It's not necessarily something that just, you know, they didn't forget to put her name up there and realize because all these people were complaining about it, like, oh, we made a little mistake. But it sort of seemed that way online. And I was like, oh, great. Yeah, Disney, it's real cool for Disney to just immediately go back <laughs> on uh, on this and add her name to it after this backlash but then just leave James Gunn hanging after you know after a huge backlash for that too that's that's real great and then uh yeah this happened today so it's pretty awesome yeah i actually i made a joke on twitter about it so i'm just going to take full credit for this happening um thanks brad <laughs> yeah <laughs> brad we were forever in your debt well i just I, you know i'm just one guy just living my life, trying trying to get by, and you know, if I make a difference, then you know that that's how it is. <laughs> and this is like a huge, uh, I think, success against those right wing kind of folks that started the whole James Gunn thing. But it makes me wonder: Do you think like now people are going to be like like that side of things is going to be outraged and be like rehire Johnny Depp for the you know next Pirates movie? <laughs> Uh, what now that they know that Disney is uh, is capable of going back well, on a decision that they've made? Yeah, but I think like like that side of things, like you know, they're kind of like, well, if you're gonna rehire him, you should rehire, you know, like that- if they're gonna make a power grab of their own. Yeah, man, I, I hope mean- not. I hope that Disney doesn't find itself at the center of some sort of right versus left um, power move or something, because that would just that would <laughs> soak the fun out of everything more than it already is. I yeah, also make a, make a sequel to John Carter, you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Suicide Squad, uh, James Gunn's reboot slash sequel, whatever you want to call it, of Suicide Squad. Uh, I, I just wonder, like, I, I know he had Guardians 3 already planned and he had some of it boarded. You know, he had the script which is done. But I'm wondering if he would, like, had any plans to you, like, you know, there was like action moments that hadn't been boarded that he was going to use on Suicide Squad now that he wasn't doing Guardians. Now he's doing Guardians again. Like, he's going to have to make a choice. I don't know. I I, I guess I'm getting a little too in the weeds here. But, uh, (laughs) 
I, I think that's interesting speculation, though, because there would sort of be a sort of tonal overlap between those two movies because Suicide Squad was made with the intention of sort of aping James Gunn's style. And now with James Gunn doing the sequel, would he just have like used his Guardians 3 ideas? How does he make sure they're somewhat different movies and people aren't just like, oh, this is just basically the same movie <laughs> done with different teams? You know, even with the soundtrack, Brad, maybe you know more about this because you cover the superhero bit, uh, bits, uh, you know, grind. Are the songs that James Gunn wants in the movie, like, actually in the script? Yeah, James Gunn definitely has songs uh, in his head and that he sometimes includes in the, in the script uh, when it comes to the Guardians movies. So uh, he already had a playlist. Yeah. I know sometimes. Well, I'm just that... wondering, like, if it could be like, you know, he had planned like the song that he really wanted to have in Guardians 3 and he didn't write it into the script. And like now he's making Suicide Squad and like he put, you know, we're going to use that in Suicide Squad. And now he's back in Guardians. It's like, f- fuck. Do you know what I mean? Like... Yeah, or, or, or even <laughs> vice versa. Or if there were if there were songs that he yeah. thought of to use for Suicide Squad and now maybe he wants to use for Guardians still. But, but at the same time, like. They were already using his script, so they might have still ended up using his soundtrack anyway, so that might not have been an issue. Um, But, yeah, I mean, it's there's so much music out there, and Gunn himself has said, too, there's times when they they don't go with a certain song that he initially thought would work, or they end up picking a different song because it it works better or something like that. So it's 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 even when he thinks of it ahead of time, it's it's in flux and can change, you know, as as time goes on. So I I don't think that'll that'll be as big of a problem. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I do think he has, like, a, a, a really good sense of taste. Like, if you look at Captain Marvel, not all of the songs in that soundtrack work. And, uh, you know, in Guns movies, like, those soundtracks are uh, – they're just so good. Okay. And plus, and, and when you look at Guardians 2, he, he doesn't go for, like, these, you know, big, well-known hits. There are definitely some more popular songs in the first Guardians than the second one. But he's, he definitely chooses songs that are – very appropriate for the characters and for the moment without trying to like going out of his way to make a soundtrack that'll, you know, uh, sell big uh, numbers on the, on the record charts. So yeah, that, I don't, that's a good point be, because that, so like a song in guardians three probably wouldn't fit suicide squad. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think that a lot of the songs could easily be transferred over. It's like, Oh, well I'll just use this over here instead. Yeah. Okay, Brad, you're going to leave us. We we have another 10 minutes of, of news stories to talk about. Uh, where can people find more of your work online? Oh, man, SlashFilm.com, on Twitter, at Ethan underscore Anderton, where I will be trying to get Disney to do more things that I want them to do. Uh, <laughs> and also check out my podcast, Go Flicks Yourself. Yeah, what, what is the next tweet going to be, Brad? Like, you got to think about your your power. You have great power here. Like, what are you going to tell Disney to do next? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um I'm going to say um, make <laughs> Tron 3. <laughs> okay, go do it. Tweet out. Bye. Bye. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to Apple. We were talking about Apple yesterday. And actually, what, what, a book you talked about on the water cooler, Apple is turning yeah. into a TV series. HD, what do we know? So Apple has given a series order to a TV series adaptation of Pachinko, which was written by Min Jin Lee. This is the best-selling novel that's a a multi-generational sort of epic about one Korean family that migrates to Japan in the 20th 20th century. It's fantastic. It's moving. It's compelling. um, And it has a really unique sort of... um, perspective of telling the sort of Korean immigrant story, but in a different setting than we're used to. And um, it is going to be uh, create, written, written and executive produced by Sue Hu, who is behind The Terror. She's co-showrunner showrunner for the AMC anthology series that uh, is highly acclaimed. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard a lot of great things. And it was on a lot of people's best TV of 2018 lists, I know. So there's um, some great... Um, names behind this and uh, this is a novel that is i think very ambitious um it's supposedly the apple's most expensive series so um and it's gonna be told with three languages too so it's gonna be in korean japanese and english so this will be um definitely a series that um is kind of apple coming right out of the gate with a really ambitious series but i think that this could be really great i know we're all skeptical of what's going on with apple's uh, TV streaming service, but it seems like a bunch of the the choices they're making are not like 
the most obvious accessible choice. Like this seems like something I would expect someone like Annapurna to make mm-hmm. into a movie. Do you know what I mean? Like it doesn't seem like um, if you're trying to get people to sign up for a streaming service and maybe this is just the cynical p- part of me. Like this doesn't seem like something that's going to get people to sign on. It's not like, you know, a star Wars live action TV show or, you know, house of cards when, you know, Kevin Spacey wasn't hated by everybody. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, uh, like, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's definitely outside of the box. And it doesn't quite um, fit with Apple's previous G-rated sort of uh, standard. Because there are some, like, you know, very mature adult sexual elements in this novel. And uh, I'm not really sure if it will stay abide by yeah. that, like, G-rated. By the way, I, I think that's overblown. Law. I think I've said this okay. on the podcast. I think those reports are a little overblown. I, I don't think we're going to see nudity or maybe the F word, but you could still, I, I don't know what happens in this book. Could you do it without nudity? You could. Yeah. I mean, it's not game of Thrones or anything. Yeah. Um, you also wrote an article about what Apple is do, uh, designing for the streaming service that gives us a little bit more insight. Cause yesterday I was kind of like complaining about uh, <laughs> direct TV and what they're doing with their now service. So uh, what is Apple planning? Well, Apple is planning to be a one-stop shop for uh, digital media and entertainment. So currently, it's in um, negotiations with HBO, Showtime, and Stars to feature their shows and movies on its platform um, and draw new subscribers with the help of the established libraries from these content partners. Um, this is partially because a lot of their uh, t- original titles, which we've talked about a bit just now with Pachinko and as well as other ones that are, you know, they have a lot of star power, but they're not ready yet. Um, and uh, apparently Apple's plans to unveil its uh, video subscription service at the, their event on March 25th. And so to sort of um, get subscribers to subscribe to them, they are using these content partners to and um, and like a media bundle essentially, to uh, draw new um, subscribers. So what is that going to mean? Like, like, will I pay one price and it would include all these services in one? See, we don't know yet. There's no official confirmation what the price tiers would be. Um, but um, a Jeffries analyst predicted that this will be a media bundle that will come with video streaming, Apple Music, a texture news app, and it could cost around $15 to gain access to the full library once it's released. Um, again, this is all sort of just Fifteen dollars you know, would be a deal and a half. By it the way, would I, be I, a better deal than a lot of ho- uh, streaming services. I used to pay that for I think Texture, which is like this me- like it's like uh, Netflix for magazines, and like mm-hmm. you basically get like hundreds and hundreds of magazines that you can read, like Entertainment Weekly, what- whatever, on your iPad, and you pay like fifteen dollars a month. I stopped paying it because I just don't have the time to read. Um, but if you're getting that Apple Music and and these service, I don't know. That just seems like it's not possible to me. I'm a little skeptical. <laughs> well, we'll find out on March 25th. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it seems like no matter what, it will be a deal because, like you were saying before, all of these streaming services. It's so it's so hard, it's so difficult to just kind of get a grasp on all of them, and like it's really frustrating that you have to go to all these separate um, apps and platforms. Yeah. But Apple is essentially offering a place for all of them in one large media bundle. <laughs> I just hope Apple's doing something new and I hope this isn't just like what Amazon's doing with their prime channels where you can like, you know, you subscribe to Amazon prime video and then like you can add on stars or add on HBO. Like Apple used to innovate and I hope they're, they're doing something interesting with whatever they're, whatever they're doing. We'll find out. Um, Peter, I know you're, you're a big Apple guy and I've seen some conflicting reports. I wonder if you've read anything about this, the event that they're supposed to be having, which is on Monday, March 25th, they they are supposed to announce details about this streaming service, but do you know if they're actually going to make the, the service available to customers that day, or is it just an announcement of the details of it? Do you know? I don't know. Uh, in the past, I mean, especially with iPhones, they usually have like a week or two. Um, before the release, they don't <clears> usually <throat> announce things so far in advance. Usually when they do, it's with it in like the prosumer stage where like they, you know, stuff would leak if they were, were to start manufacturing it. <clears throat> um, so I'm assuming if they're going to announce it that, you know, we're going to be able to get on this thing soon. I- I'm wondering you uh, with you, Ben, because you're a bit more, 
I guess, frugal in the yep. <laughs> uh, uh, streaming services that you're subscribing to? Like, yes. does any of this sound promising to you? Well, now, I mean, I think I'm not sure if I've mentioned this or not, but right now I have uh, Netflix, Hulu and Amazon. I, I uh, subscribe to Amazon like when I started getting my groceries delivered to my house. So uh, before I was very selective about what I, w you know, what streaming services I was going to get. And I'm actually still planning on subscribing to the Criterion channel service as well. Um, so I I'm not sure if this particular bundle will do anything for me because I already subscribed to HBO through my cable service. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff is sort of already there. Um, but, but you could cancel your HBO. You're paying like, what, like $15 a month or something for that? I actually, it's it's so complicated and so stupid, but yeah. Spectrum, I'm, I'm like grandfathered in on this old uh, plan, and it's like a whole thing, um, you know, with like a bundle with my internet service. It's like, it's such a nightmare to have to get on the phone and call them and like figure out what the <laughs> actual thing is. And I did, I did probably like a week's worth of work to secure the, the exact plan that I have right now, and I got them to promise me that they weren't going to change it for like a year or two. So I, I'm just going to hold on to what I have until... I'm forced to make a, a change. You know, speaking of HBO, Game of Thrones is coming up, and we finally learned uh, the run times for season eight. I know we had uh, speculated, and there were, there was some talk that some of these episodes were going to be feature, uh, almost the the size of feature length films. So, Ben, what do what what do we know now that we have the run times? Yeah, so earlier this week, um, word actually came out officially from HBO that the first two of the final six episodes of Game of Thrones were only going to be around an hour, which is like the traditional length of the show. And so there are four episodes left that we weren't sure what the runtimes were going to be, but that changed today because uh, HBO officially released those runtimes. And they are an hour and 22 minutes, an hour and 18 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes, and an hour and 20 minutes. So those last four episodes of the series are basically going to be like hovering right around 80 minutes long. And uh, that is, I mean, you know, I think there were a lot of reports. Yeah. As you mentioned, you know, this could be feature length stuff. So we all sort of assumed that maybe they were going to be like 90 minutes long. And the uh, season seven finale was about 80 minutes long. So it's not really much longer than that, but still 80 minutes is like, you know, if you've seen movies like Before Sunset or Run, uh, Run Lola Run or Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, that's the length of of those films. So it's not like this is, you know, uh, an animated Disney movie from way back in the day where they're like barely crossing the hour mark uh, and calling it a feature length. This is like legitimate movies that have run this runtime. So we're going to get to spend some more time with these Game of Thrones characters as we're finally heading into the final stretch of these episodes. The, uh, H.T., well, you, you're no longer watching Game of Thrones, right? I'm not. Um, although I, I am interested, Ben. Uh, I know that the final episode or final, the second to last episode is going to contain the one big uh, battle scene. Um, do you think that like that essential like feature length battle scene, um, are you looking forward to that? Or is, are you kind of in interested in to see how they're going to sort of structure that battle scene in, in like being this long and much longer than they've had before. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of uh, nervous about this because yeah, th as you know, there, there's supposed to be this massive, massive battle, and I think the the Battle of Helm's Deep in one of the Lord of the Rings movies was only like 40 minutes or something, and this is going to be almost double that if they do you know keep the entire battle to one episode. Um, I, I'm worried about it because the battle episodes have never been my favorite on Game of Thrones. I've always appreciated them from like a technical and and like production aspect aspect and like how impressive it is to orchestrate and organize all of that and get that uh, you know accomplished but i found that a lot of times the emotional core is not there but i have read a lot of interviews with the the filmmakers and the showrunners and everything talking about how they're they really put a lot of time and effort into making sure that each individual moment within this huge battle episode is from a specific perspective and actually you know, keeps the flow going and all of that. So I'm I'm cautiously optimistic, but I am a little worried about it. Are you sad that you only have 432 minutes of Game of Thrones left? I am. Yeah, um, my wife and I are doing a rewatch right now, and we're we're you know coming. Uh, we're like halfway through. Or I guess just started season seven, and. I just looked at her last night as we were watching. I was like, I can't believe that we're going to have new episodes of the show very, very soon. And then that's it. Like, th there's only six more episodes of Game of Thrones, guys. It's crazy. 
I don't know. I don't know what is going on with, you know, James Gunn being rehired to direct Guardians Galaxy Volume 3. Like, my, my brain is just exploding all over the place <laughs> today. And uh, th- that brings us to the end of today's Slash Film Daily. Where can we find more of your work online, HT? You can find me writing every day at SlashFilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at HTranBooey. Ben, where can we find you? You can find me uh, at SlashFilm.com as well. I am on Twitter at Ben Pears. You can find me at Slash Home on all social media. You can find more about the stories we talked about on today's podcast. So if you want to read that whole article about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, you can head over to Slash Home.com or it's linked in the show notes. This podcast, Slash Home Daily, is published every weekday on iTunes, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. And uh, please send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at Peter at Slash Home.com. 